Today on Inside the Gate, we have two great scientists joining us. We have Dr. Kathy Ann Soderberg and Dr. Michael Fanto, both of whom are working on the quantum technologies here at AFRL's Information Directorate. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks for joining us, and we're glad to have you on the show today as we talk about quantum, especially as we're heading into World Quantum Day in April. And our thought here is that we'd have a nice conversation uh, to help our audience understand the complex science behind quantum. So let's get started. So first off, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do at the Information Directorate, uh, and, and anything else, really, that kind of tells us who you are? Sure, yeah, thank you for having us. We're excited to be here. So as you heard, my name's Kathy Ann Soderberg, and I'm a principal research physicist here, and I'm the lead for the Trapped Ion Quantum Networking Group. How about you, Michael? Uh, hi, thanks again for having us, too. Um, so I'm Mike. I'm a senior research physicist, and I'm the lead for the Integrated Photonics Group for Quantum. So those are some big titles, some big things. I think you know, as we get into the background for our audience, you can tell us a little bit more about some of those terms that you just threw out there, um, you know, including photonics and some other stuff. Uh, so you know, in terms of that, you know, quantum computing, um, just give us a little idea. What are you guys doing in your research, and and what what does it involve? Sure. So in our labs, we study both quantum computing and quantum networking. And so what that means is we use single particles, like single atoms or single photons, to do things differently than you can with classical devices. So we use quantum bits, they're called qubits, and they behave much differently than classical bits. So, Kathy Ann, you said photons, and many in our audience are probably thinking Star Trek or Star Wars. So <laughs> it, it is photons, just like that, but unlike Star Wars, you really have to do a lot for photons to interact. So unlike lightsabers, you don't have photons going like this. They pass through each other. So you got to do a lot of things to actually make them talk to each other. And a lot of our research here is how do you get these different qubits, trapped ions, superconducting qubits, photons, to talk to each other? Because if you're going to make a network, like Kathy Ann said, you want everything to talk. And so that's a big thing that you guys are doing is kind of advancing computing and networking for the Air Force in, in general is, you know, we're taking quantum computers which are a lot different than today's digital computers. So what's the difference between a quantum network and traditional networking, the quantum computer side and a traditional computer? How does that differ and why is the quantum computer going to be better for us? You can start. Uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> as I said before, we use qubits as the basis for this computer. And qubits have some very special properties. They can hold things called a superposition. So in classical computing, bits can only ever be 0 or 1. But in a quantum computer, you can actually make 0 plus 1 at the same time. So that gives you much more storage space to work with. With, uh, you know, with one qubit, you have two bits. With two qubits, you have four. It goes like 2 to the n, where n is the number of qubits. So if you had 50, you could store the Library of Congress. And if you had only 300, which is not many in quantum computing, you could have more state space available to you than there are particles in the universe. So better than an abacus, right? I mean, oh, yeah. uh, way better. Way better. Yeah. Yep. And then, and then later we'll probably talk about entanglement as the other key thing you need for quantum computing that really gives quantum we computing. We are space. going to talk about entanglement. And a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of stuff about entanglement. In fact, in fact people like, I know a lot of people are probably picking up on that term because they've seen the Marvel movies and we, we just talking about, you know, quantum mania. Um, but they do mention entanglement in that and I think they take it to a, a slightly different level than you guys might take entanglement. They talk about entanglement in terms of actually human interaction within, you know, a kind of theoretical way. But how do you guys talk about entanglement and what does it mean for the networking? So when we think of entanglement, and I know in quantum mania, they're like, they enter the quantum realm. Well, we live in the quantum realm. <laughs> we work in the quantum realm every day. So that's good. It's good, it's good that it's getting it out there. Um, but when we think do of entanglement. You, do, wait, do you have to shrink <laughs> yourself to a subatomic particle level? No, to get stay normal size, normal people size. And just so you know, if you're listening in, they are average size humans. They are not <laughs> subatomic particles. No, no. <laughs> They're not changing. No, we're still here. Um, no, so when we think of entanglement, you think of you have two particles or two quantum systems that are perfectly correlated to each other. An effect on one affects the other. <coughs> which is a very weird 
thing. Like you don't think of like two rocks. You touch one rock, it doesn't affect the other rock. But when you think of quantum systems, one of the beautiful pieces is this property of entanglement, that these things are perfectly correlated to each other. You affect one, you can sense it on the other particle. So you think of these quantum networks, you have this long distance, you're sending these photons or quantum signals across this network, and you can start entangling or correlating distant nodes just through measurements. And it's a pretty powerful thing. So as Kathy Ann said, you've got these qubits, we've got this superposition state, and you've got a single qubit, it's got two states in it, it up, down, down, up. But the really way that these things talk to each other and the way that this whole system scales is through both properties. You've got these quantum bits that have the superposition state, but to get all of them to talk to each other, you need the entanglement between them. And entanglement's fragile, so there's a lot of engineering, there's a lot of everything else that has gone into making these systems stable. Well, you just said something, Michael, that's like kind of hit here on next question, which is it is a powerful component. <coughs> and, you know, the power there, too, is also transformative for what we're doing in terms of quantum computing and quantum in general. Um, so it tells a little bit like the potential for it to be transformative in terms of where we are going as a country, as a global environment with quantum networking, and how will that um, how, how will they, how will this perform for the average human? <coughs> what will be the benefit to everybody once this is kind of in play on that global kind of platform? A lot of it, you, I mean, so. And we know this is probably somewhat theoretical. Wow, well, it, <laughs> and, it's and not going to happen tomorrow. Right, it's, we, should, we should put that little caveat out there. This, this is years away, right. and we know that. But, um, but, but from your aspect, though, as you look at it, what, what is to you the exciting thing that's going to bring uh, when, when you see what the potential is that people are going to be like, this, why, why haven't we had this all of our life? There's a couple things. I mean, one of them is sensing. So you, if you take... Uh, quantum systems and you entangle them, or you increase the number of, let's say, photons, entangled photons in it, you can get resolution that's greater than you standard would let get from a single wavelength, or at that given wavelength. So you can get higher resolution. You can get entangled sensors. You can have this quantum network, which is secure, and not secure by like obfuscation or like RSA or encryption. It's secure by the fundamental laws of physics. So when we talk about superposition and we talk about entanglement, this superposition state, you look at it's a one or a zero, but it's no, it's both at the same time. So without, and we're not talking faster than light communication either, so you have these two particles, they could be separated by the distance of the universe, but there's still a classical channel between them that is limited by the speed of light. So not, we're not violating anything here. But you have these two particles which are correlated and this superposition state that says, I'm an eavesdropper. I'm going to get in and grab part of your signal. What was it? Was it heads? Was it tails? You don't know. So that eavesdropper gets in and gets no <coughs> useful information. But on top of that, they're entangled. So you know an eavesdropper got into one particle. It affects the state of the other one. So not only is it tamper-proof, it's tamper-evident, but you get that for free, which is pretty impressive. And we should put a caveat there too, uh, that also we have other divisions here at oh, AFRL yeah. that are working on, you mentioned sensing, so I, I want to give a little shout out because we do have an AFRL sensing group. So some, a lot of our TDs are working on different areas of quantum. Um, and, and they focus on some of the specialties. I know we've had conversations with the sensing group in the past, but we are specifically working on the, the entanglement networking kind of feature, mm -hmm. um, which is here at the Information Directorate. You know, as you, as you both kind of approach your work, there's a lot that's going on in the commercial world as well. We have big players in this. We have IBM, we have Google, you know, all are throwing their hat into it. And 
you know, what are some of the challenges as you're doing your research at, at the government side and at AFRL, uh, what are some of the challenges you face that might not be so present in the commercial world that we're, you know, stumbling on? Or are they not roadblocks? <coughs> are those the things that we actually are getting further ahead on uh, where they aren't? Yeah, I think it's wonderful how many companies are involved in quantum information right now. And I don't think it's inhibiting us at, at all. And if anything, we're benefiting from it because they're, you know, working to make the technology better every day so that they can make a product to sell to people. And we can leverage that, those advances, and kind of tailor it to what we need. And so I think, if anything, it's helped us a lot. And we have really good relationships with a lot of those companies as well. And we have technical discussions with them and to see where we can collaborate better. So, I mean, I, you just kind of mentioned, you know, that it benefits us when they work on those things. And I think one of the benefits, you know, that people should understand is we are the government. We work for the Air Force. So we're, we're the Air Force Research Laboratory. Um, so this technology is obviously we're looking at it for a practical application for the warfighter. And how will this benefit that warfighter? I think you kind of touched on it, Michael, with you know, the hackability and, and being able to not grab certain pieces of information. But really, what are we looking at when we talk about, you know, placing quantum technologies in, in the warfighters' hands? Sure, yeah, I can take that if you want. And okay. this is an unclassified <laughs> answer for everybody <laughs> listening. We are not going to go too deep into this one, but we're going to give you a simple answer. <laughs> yeah. So quantum has the potential to be hugely disruptive. In, in all areas, timing, sensing, networking, and computing. So Mike talked a lot about the sensing and, and networking, and, and I'll say for computing, you know, the kind of holy grail for computing is what a quantum computer could do better is factor numbers. And so that comes into play with, with everything we do today, right? When you go online, all the information is, is um, encrypted using big numbers that, that computers available today can't factor. But if you had a quantum computer, that would actually allow you to factor things exponentially faster than any known classical algorithm today. Um, and that's held true for the last two decades. And so if someone developed a quantum computer, it would put all these encryption schemes at risk. And that really kicked the field off around the mid-1990s. And it's propelled the field forward today, kind of you know, the, the hope of getting to a, a full-scale computer capable of factoring big numbers. Okay. Now, we were talking about <coughs> space. We've talked about sensing. I know we've had a conversation with the sensing group about things that go into space. And you kind of touched on, you know, going speed of light, and mm -hmm. we know it's not Star Trek, so we're not doing warp speed things with quantum. But there is going to be quantum that is capable of doing things for us in space. And I, we're not going to get too deep into this because it, it isn't really where we're focused, but it does kind of touch on networking and how we mm -hmm. receive information, get information. So where do we see quantum and kind of like the space realm? Because we, we do serve, you know, we're one agency it serves two branches so we do serve the air force and space force so where are we touching on in, in terms of that kind of component when it, we reach into the space domain communications is one yeah. big aspect of it i mean if you're going to send quantum information any distance really the only long distance carrier of quantum information is a photon so if you've got something from ground stations uh to like a satellite you're going to send photons and you're going to send quantum information and It'll be secured by the laws of physics, and you can use that. Another is sensing, too. So you look at for telescopes. You want to start looking for exoplanets or all these other sensors out there. Um, you can do long baseline interferometry with like integrating and entangling information from telescopes. That's pretty interesting. You can start getting s higher resolution and looking for planets surrounding another star. Yeah, and our colleagues out at the um, direct to energy, direct to RD, have a space-based quantum networking program. Right. And we collaborate with them quite a bit. Yeah. <coughs> well, revolutionizing stuff for sure. And I think our time is coming to an end, so I want to thank you both for being with us today. But before we go, I just want to kind of wrap us up with a couple of questions and get your thoughts on just a couple of things. You know, we know that quantum is getting a little bit more talk in the mainstream media. Uh, there's movies about it. It seems to be, you know, there's TV shows about different things that use the quantum acronym. Um, all these things are, are kind of like pushing, you know, your field into the limelight. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, is that something that kind of 
benefits you when you see that you know quantum is getting more traction in mainstream? I mean, yeah, I, it gets people interested. And one of the biggest things is that we want to keep excitement in the next generation of scientists, and that this is out in the media is great. I mean, they keep reaching out; they want to get into this field. You see, universities now offering graduate programs in it that didn't before. This is huge. There was a show um, called Devs recently, and it was had a quantum computer in it. And I will say, one of the nicest things about it was, it was the best cable management I've ever seen in a dilution fridge. So whoever did that, they should be uh, extremely congratulated. But it's centered on it, it got people excited. So I think it's great. So if you're watching, we'll throw a little clip up of that episode. And then also, um, I want to just ask in terms of, you know, quantum in the next decade, where do you think we'll be uh, from, from your work here at the Information Directorate 1, but then also just in general in terms of, you know, the quantum field, where do you think we'll be in the next decade? Yeah, I, it's going to be interesting. I think quantum's in a really interesting place right now where we're able to control entanglement better than we, we could even five years ago. And so I think the next 10 years, you know, we may, we may not get fully to where we think we're going to go in full-scale networks mm -hmm. and things like that, but I think we'll make a lot of scientific advances that will be amazing. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give an example of, of how that might happen. So there's a group at NIST that works on atomic clocks, and they also do quantum information processing work. And a few years ago, they made the world's most accurate clock. It won't lose a second And I think something like 33 billion years. And they were able to do that by using quantum information, some of these entangling operations that we talked about earlier. And they wouldn't have been able to make such a good clock if they weren't also researching quantum computing. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And I, I agree. I think it's going to grow really quickly. Um, a lot of it because a lot of the infrastructure has been set up over the last 20 years, too. We now have foundries that can produce quantum integrated photonics. We have companies that are making small vacuum chambers or getting to that point where we can start fielding smaller systems. It's just impressive the amount of stuff that we don't have to reinvent all the time. It helps. It really does. I think it's truly impressive and I want to thank you both for your candid and informational replies today. Um, it's been a pleasure having you both join us and if you're looking for more information on quantum and the incredible research that's being conducted right here at the Air Force Research Laboratory, you can visit afresearchlab.com slash technology slash AFRL dash quantum dash labs. We know it's a long one, but it's got some really cool information out there. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Inside the Gate. Again, I'm your host, Mark Donofio. Video and audio editing and production are provided by the talented Larry the Rock Rocco. Graphics are supplied by our industrious Carrie Blesser Hartbrecher. And photos are courtesy of Albert the Saint Santa Croce. This is a production of AFRL Public Affairs and produced live at the Information Directorate in beautiful central New York.